Um, Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Happiness Journey with Dr. Dan podcast, where every journey is worth living. My name is Dr. Dan, and I'm your host for today's episode. I am a cognitive behavior psychotherapist specializing in anger management issues, both court-appointed and private, marriage counseling, dissociative identity disorders, narcissistic personality disorders, depression, anxiety, and so much more. If you need any assistance, reach out to us at 301-325-1550. Now, enough about me. Today, I'm very excited to have our in our podcast a special guest and author, Chancellor Jackson. Now, since I'm not very qualified enough to be able to introduce him to all of our thousands of listeners, I will leave it up to him to take over and provide us with some key information about who he is and why did he write his book, 14 Days in Beijing. Chancellor, the floor is yours, my friend. <laughs> Dr. Dan, man, blessings and balance to you. Blessings and balance to everyone that's tuning in right now. Appreciate you for having me on your show to showcase me and my many, many talents. Um, Chancellor K. Jackson from Atlanta, Georgia, born and raised. Um, I'm Native American, Dr. Derek Kibatanka. I'm only 25 years old as well. Um, Sagittarius, uh, very free spirited, down to earth dude, very easy going. Um, I graduated from college, Stetson University, the Stetson University, uh, with a just degree in communication and media studies back in 2018. I also played football there as well for all four years. Um, and those that are familiar with football, football fans, I'm a, I'm a DB at heart. I, that's the only position I primarily played my entire career. Corner, free safety, strong safety, nickel corner, you name it. True DB all in all. But um, yeah, that's more, that's just a little bit of my athletic background. After I graduated from college, I landed my first job <laughs> teaching English to children in China. Um, so I entered China on October 10th, 2018. Um, and I was teaching kids as young as three years old, all the way up to 14. And China was the best experience I've ever experienced in my life. Like China was everything that I could hope for in the first job. It was fulfilling. It was adventurous, um, challenging, uh, just completely taboo. You know what I'm saying? It just compares to what most people do <laughs> once they uh, graduate from college. Um, so I had a lot of fun meeting a lot of great people from different walks of the earth, working with the kids made the whole job, made the experience worthwhile because that's what I went out there to do. So if I didn't enjoy working, then that was going to definitely be the determining factor of my overall experience. But the kids made the job worthwhile. So I enjoyed working with them. Um, and yeah, so I was doing this for six months straight. And I was supposed to do a year. That's how long my contract was set. And then everything came to a, a, a screeching halt on April 4th, 2019. That's uh, when I was arrested. Um, in Beijing and detained for 14 days for uh, marijuana charges. Okay. Um, so yeah, I was at home. It was a day off of me, a Thursday. I was finna get ready to um, go to an event with some coworkers and friends. And before I, I was gonna go to the event, I'm like, hey, I'm a pregame before I slide. And those that don't know what pregaming is, like before you and your friends or a group of people go out on a night full of festivities, like, hey, let's meet up at somebody's house first. We're gonna turn up at the house first. Then we're gonna go out and enjoy ourselves even more. So I was at, my, at the apartment by myself, <laughs> pregaming, getting ready to slide to this event. And it missed me getting dressed. I hear a knock at the door, open the door. Well, look through the people. It's three officers from the Beijing police. Of course, I know this is not, <laughs> this isn't something that's supposed to be happening. So of course, the scrum put everything up, open the door, they come walking in, press, they're asking me about drugs. I'm sitting here playing a fool. Like, I don't know what they're talking about. Um, end up drug testing me right there on the spot. Failed the drug test, of course. And you know what I'm saying? That's when they was able to find the, uh, the cannabis, that, the rest of the cannabis that I did have. And that's when they slapped the cups on me and took me to two different precincts. Um, to then, within the time of me at doing being at these two different precincts, the first one I was there for like 40 minutes. The second one I was there for like 14, 13 hours. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And at the second one, they did my interrogation. The interrogation scene is very dramatic in the, in the book as well, just because they walked me, they walked me to the bottom of the precinct into this room and walked me to this chair. This chair looks like an electric chair, but it's all metal. Like, it ain't, you know, say most electric chairs, they just strap you in with let, nah, this is all metal. It locked my whole body in one place. Only thing I could move is my head. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I did my whole interrogation, just locked up like this into this chair. But I was very compliant, very, I, I was still high as while all this was going on. So I was very calm, cool, and collected. Um, 
I'm very positive. I'm very positive individual. So I wasn't necessarily concerned of like, damn, like what's going to happen to me? Like I wasn't scared of nothing. I knew I was going to be good when it's all said and done. I just had no clue what was going to happen. Um, so do my interrogation, take my identity. You know what I'm saying? They process all that work, the time they do all of that. You know what I'm saying? Several, several hours have passed. <clears throat> they come back to get me, have me change back into my regular clothes, and then we get back in the van. So at this point, I have no clue what's going on. Nobody has explained anything to me. And I'm not asking no questions at either. You know what I mean? So we ride and ride. Next thing I know, we, are uh, we arrive at this facility to, uh, detailed with tall, wall tall walls and barbed wire. And that's when I realized, okay, <laughs> like this story, like we ain't finished yet. So they processed me um, into the actual jail jail and walked me to cell 209. And I'm locked up in this cell for 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 15 people to one cell, nine wooden beds. All I had was one plastic bowl and one plastic spoon for 14 days straight. Wow. But were they accusing you of dealing drugs or using um, I honestly don't know. <laughs> I know I got caught with it. I only got caught with 1.4 grams. Those that are, you know what I'm saying, do partake in cannabis, 1.4 grams is not a lot. Even if you don't partake in cannabis, units of measurement, 1.4 grams of anything is not a lot. You know what I'm saying? So, of course, you, I'm not serving, I'm not dealing with this amount that I have on me. It's all personal use. You know? But, you know what I'm saying, we in China, they're going to think whatever they think. So, that's not here nor there. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I just know. I just had to hold myself accountable, first first and foremost, and most importantly, you know what I mean? I was constantly made the decision that I knew would get me into trouble, and I still chose to partake in it. So everything that everything panning out the way that it did, it was nobody to point the finger at but myself. So I had to hold myself accountable first and foremost. And then, you know what I'm saying, there's just no point in dwelling in the neg negative aspects, you know what I'm saying? It's, what, why are we going to sit here and talk about the problem over and over again? What's going to be the solution? How are we going? You know what I'm saying? So that's just how my minds work. Okay, it is what it is at this point. I don't know what's going to happen. Nobody knows it's happening to me. I know I'm going to be good, but what will take place moving forward to, for me to uh, get up out of this predicament? That's what. That's what how I'm. That's how my mind is working. Um, so I'm just thinking ahead and trying to stay positive. And but yeah, I, honestly, I had no clue. I'm here to tell you I did 14 days. You know what I'm saying? And as you read the story, you have no clue <laughs> how long you're going to be in there. You just sitting. You just sit and you collect the information as you go as you about know. how the jail works, how the process works, how everything works. You know what I'm saying? Because you just don't know. You just, man, just a, a cub lost in the Serengeti. <laughs> so is it like the TLC show, uh, Locked Up Abroad? Is it the same oh, yeah. kind of conditions that you would see on the on the different documentary? Or is it something like more low key or I would say uh, low security? Was it like, uh, what kind of like, was it maximum or is it? Was oh. like Oh no! This was uh, which, we a uh, twenty-four hour lockdown. So <laughs> we, you know, say we you're not leaving that cell unless you meeting with immigration or your U.S. embassy. Oh, I mean, just your embassy, based on where you're from. Aside that, you don't leave that cell. <laughs> you don't leave that cell. But China is a very strict, strict country, and they're very disciplined people. So as far as just my relationships or dynamic amongst the other cellmates, it was it wasn't nothing. It was no animosity, no malice you know what i'm saying it was all just peace love and prosperity they was just really just curious to have a foreigner <laughs> in they sell especially a man of color and i had lots at that point in time so they was just really just intrigued with just learning as much about me as they could but with the language barrier it, it, it was it's was like i felt the genuineness and you know what i'm saying just their energy but it's like man we, we can't even fully communicate with each other so it's just like yeah. We still asked out, you feel me? So like it still sucks. So uh, I'm I'm spending a lot of my t a lot of the time is just in my head, just because I can't talk to nobody. I can only talk to myself. You know what I mean? So I was it's a, just a lot of just at war with my reflection. The first three chapters of the book, and what I just explained to y'all, broke down to y'all, is essentially chapter one in a nutshell. So we still early into the story. It's still oh. a lot about the story. Yeah, yeah. It, that's just fourteen days. It may be like it may feel like fourteen years. Oh, yeah, no, nah, for real. <laughs> Especially when you don't know what's going on. Yeah, that was going home. And how did you deal with the culture shock when it comes yeah. to uh, teaching in China, yeah. living in the culture, um, interacting with people, which you had limited interaction, obviously, uh, and then <clears> suddenly from being on the outside and, and experiencing the life in China to being locked up and being <laughs> put into a cage, basically, yeah. kind of like 
We, you don't know when you're going to leave. You don't know who's going to come and help you. You don't know who's going to come and take you out. So how did this process go? Um, so essentially, like, I already knew I was entering a different world. Once I got hired for the job, I'm like, okay, this is going to be completely different. This is literally going to be a different world that I'm about to experience. Um, but I've always been interested in China. You know, in the introduction of my book, um, I'm at breakfast with my family. We sit down at the table eating breakfast. My mom asked me and my brother, she said, what's three places in the world y'all want to go? And I'll make sure that we go. I'm like seven eight, or eight years old at this time. First place I'm, I already had my answer ready. I said, China. She, I was, she was just shocked that I already had an answer. She's like, why China? I was like, that's where everything is made. That's the only reason, that's the only interest of China, you know what I'm saying, that I had just because I'm like, every, every product that I look at the back of it says made in China. It's every, I'm like, everything is made from one place. What is China doing that? We, you know what I'm saying? What, what they got going over there? There's, everything's made over there. So I've always been interested in China since I was a kid. So 15 years later, everything came full circle. <laughs> so I already knew, you know what I'm saying? I was finna just enter a whole different land, a whole different world. Um, I knew it was going to be a strict culture, um, but I'm a Sagittarius, so I'm the ultimate, ultimate adventurer. Um, I'm spontaneous. I'm optimistic. So I was really just excited about the trip, if anything. You know what I'm saying? Just, I know this is going to be a life-changing journey. I'm going to grow in many facets when it's all said and done. I know it's going to be a great stepping stone as far as finding just my purpose, a career, what it, you know what I'm saying? Just uh, learning about myself too. Cause like I played football for nine years. I identified as a student athlete for nine years. So once that came to the end, now I'm entering, I got to re-identify myself. I got to learn myself all over again. I got to figure out who I am, what it is that I want out of life, all of that. So I knew China would be a great way to figuring all of that out. Um, so when I entered, it really wasn't nothing too, too crazy or just too overwhelming just cause I was already mentally prepared and, yeah, I'm having fun on top of that. So it's like, oh yeah, this is cool to me. Um, I learned a little bit of the language before I entered, just enough to move and groove as far as having an in-depth conversation like me and you are having right now. No, it's not happening. No, no, <laughs> no, that's not happening. But I just enough to move and groove, get what I want and get what I need. Um, and I was mainly around foreigners, you know what I'm saying? So I really didn't have to use Mandarin as much unless I'm like really, really in the field, like at the grocery store or trying to, you know what I'm saying, trying to buy something. I'm around just locals. That's the only time I had to really, really use it. Even then, probably not, because we got, it's technology so advanced, you get translation apps. You you can still maneuver just fine. Um, wow. I say the biggest culture shock for me was just the hygiene aspects. <laughs> that that was the biggest culture shock. Them, yeah, they, they, Chinese folks are different when it comes to hygiene. They're different. Very, very different. They don't wash their hands. I thought they were like always nicely cut, nicely dressed when they go to work, etc. So what kind of like when you say hygiene well, in terms of what they don't wash their hands. That's the that's the most that's for that's the most pivotal. I know they don't wash their hands for a fact. Uh, the school I worked in didn't have soap or toilet paper in the bathroom. So you got you think like I said, I'm working with kids as young as three years old. These ki kids don't have no hygiene awareness at all. So the fact that ain't no soap. In the bathroom for them for them to wash their hands. Like they gave us teachers soap and toilet paper, our own personal soap and toilet paper to take to the bathroom. But as far as everybody else, oh, uh, it was quiet for them. It was you know what I'm saying? So it was like <laughs> and it, I was there during the winter time too. So you got all these germs, call cause kids getting sick, yeah. coughing and sneezing, and ain't nobody washing their hands after they come back from the bathroom. You know what I'm saying? A lot of them don't really brush their teeth like that. I had multiple students. I'm talking about they teeth are black, <laughs> like you know what I'm saying. It, it can and these and I work and I live in the business district of Beijing. I'm on the east side. I'm in a section with people that got money. So the fact that y'all not taking care of this, if you're not washing your hands, you're not brushing your teeth. I know for a fact you're not really washing your body like that. You know what I mean? Wow. I know for a fact you're not. I, come on. Uh, so wow. just that whole aspect, and then being locked up, it, it was even worse in there. So <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That was I say that was just the hygiene was the biggest culture shock for me, just because I'm like, whoa. I, yeah, we don't, I don't do that. We don't do that from where I'm from. Like, no, nah, we, <laughs> we don't do that. Everything else is pretty cool. Like, everything else was was, was tolerable. Um, wasn't even nothing too crazy. I'll just say the hygiene was the biggest thing, for real. Very, very interesting. And now, um, it, let's talk about when you were inside the jail. How did you know, or when you say 14 days in Beijing and, and being locked up, how did you know? Did you have any sign as to who's going to be coming? Did you call your embassy? Did you mm. call... How did the process go for them to come on the 14th day and said, Mr. Jackson, 
you're free to go, but you have yeah. to leave the country. So I had, like I said, my, I was just sitting, 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 even meeting with the immigration, even meeting with my embassy. They still had, they had no information for me. They was, they was shocked to hear that I didn't receive any information. They just like, mm, that's weird. I'm talking to other foreign uh, inmates like, okay, you supposed to do five days. You supposed to do 10 days. You supposed to do 15. I'm like, well, damn, how everybody, how everybody here know what they, you know what I'm saying? They situation, I'm the only one that don't. And they looking at me like, yeah, that is weird. I don't know why. You know what I'm saying? That's just your, yeah, that's just your circumstance, but it doesn't typically work like that. Like you should receive all this information. I'm like, well, well somebody, yeah, I must not have uh, read the rules <laughs> correctly because uh, I have no clue what I'm doing. I'm just sitting here, bro. So it, as far as just the actual resources that I could access to get information, it still was no information to be given. You know what I'm saying? So it was still like, it was, it was very overwhelming for sure, for sure. But I'm like, hey, <laughs> just trust the process, trust the process, trust the process. And the universe and the universe took heed to that. They knew my situation and knew that I didn't receive any inf viable information. But my subconscious helped me find comfort throughout being locked up in there. I had a lot of visions, a lot of dreams that pretty much foreshadowed how long I was going to be there in essence, without basically telling me straight up. And it's crazy. It's, uh, I think it's early within the first three chapters. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm asleep. I'm having a dream that I'm sitting with two other just random, just random people. Well, we out in China. Um, we've just chilling. We smoking and we talking about getting arrested in China for weed, ironically. And one of the people wow. in the group that I'm with, she was like, yeah, I heard if you get caught with more than three grams, it's an automatic month sentence. And like, as soon as she said that, it, the room just got silent. And that's when I started to wake up again. And it, I started to hear the, the voice of the guard on the intercom to wake us up. And I woke, I just sat up and I'm like, okay. That, I'm just thrown, I'm, I'm, my psyche is thrown a little bit just cause I had a dream, just that in depth. You know what I'm saying? And that's just that in tune to uh, have, <laughs> just based on my situation. And I'm like, okay. So she said three grams automatic month sentence. If I got caught with 1.4 grams, that's which is half to less than half of three. Yes. We're talking about two weeks worth of time. Ah, oh, okay. So that's that's interesting. Yeah, but, from, uh, and that, but this is this is just thoughts that I'm having. These are just I'm like, okay, that's two weeks worth of time. That means I'm gonna be here for two day, two weeks. I don't even know, but I don't know if I can do two weeks in here. And then take it even more, take it even uh break it down even more. I got caught with 1.4 grams, right? Which is a decimal. You take away that decimal, what number do you get? Two, uh, well, one actually. If it, well, if you go over one point five, then you round it up to two. Yeah, but one point four, right? Yeah. It's the decimal between that one point four. You take away that decimal, what number do you got? Fourteen. Fourteen. Mm -hmm. Fourteen. <laughs> you're saying one point four, fourteen days. That's oh, interesting. Two. Yeah. So it's like I, I, I receive a lot of just, I believe a lot, a lot of just man visions and messages from just my ancestors and the higher beings uh, just far as just an idea of how the situation will play out. But still, I have no clue <laughs> if it's going to be set in stone or not. And yeah, just on the 14th day, they, vote, I'm just, they just came and called me. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I'm sitting there like, what y'all want? <laughs> They're like, come on, come on. I'm like, what you mean? I'm like, no, like, come on. It's time you go. I'm like, oh. And I'm flashing back to all the dreams and stuff that I had. I had another dream that was symbolic about how I would get released. And it's essentially the same way I had the dream is the same way that I got released. So it's just, you know what I'm saying? It, it was, it, it's a crazy, it's a crazy experience, like a very spiritual experience as well. Cause I'm just, I'm a very yeah. spiritual, getting, spiritual getting person. Getting out of this hellhole for sure. Now, how did, yeah, you yeah. React? how did you react when you actually went or they called you in? And what did they tell you? Did they tell you, pack your bags and leave the country? You're not welcome here anymore? Or what was the process at that point? Well, so yeah, once they like came to get me from the cell, um, I'm just my mind is just so blown, just cause I'm I'm flashing back to the dream that I had, the second, well, one of the third dreams that I had about how I would get released. And I'm like, man, this is exactly, it's pretty much the exact way I dreamt of them coming to get me. So I'm just just blown away. And so it's taking me a minute to grab my things. Within all I got is grab my, is my bowl and spoon. Yeah. But even then, I'm, I'm just like I'm so. Now I was like, bro, I was so in tuned 
<laughs> with my, you know what I'm saying, subconscious, like, I'm just, I, it's powerful to me. I'm just, I, I can't, I'm still in disbelief, but best believe I'm excited at the same time. So I just grabbed my bowl and spoon, walk me out of the cell, you know what I'm saying? Have me get dressed, sign a bunch of paperwork and stuff. They take me to my apartment, pack up the rest of my things, and immediately as I, I got I got done with that, took me straight to the airport, and I was deported from the country. So this all within four to six hours. <laughs> Release. Wow. It was. It was. Yeah, yeah, all like that. You know what I mean? You're not welcome here for how long? Is it like uh, for life? Yeah, I'm banned. Yeah, I was banned for five years, so I can't go back to 2024 if I choose to go back. If you choose, okay. Yeah, if I choose to go back. Wow. So what, what kind of like, based on everything that you've experienced, being in a different country, being uh, locked up there, um, do you still look at China as being a very unwelcoming country? Or do you still feel that the people there are still loving, still caring, still nice, but it's well, just a system that is a bit much more stricter than the one in the U.S.? Yeah, it's just, it's just a country like... You know what I'm saying the way it's ran. It's just a very, very, very strict, strict, strict country. Um, as far as the people, the people were were lovely. I, I the people were amazing. Like I received some of the best customer service I've ever received in my life over there. <laughs> and I and I and I do not over exaggerate that. Um, I, it was to the point. It was like you got to tell them to chill just a little bit. Like, bro, you. I, I appreciate the gesture and everything, but it's like, man, you ain't got to, you ain't got to work so hard. You ain't got to do that. You ain't got to do all that, bro. You know what I'm saying? I appreciate it, but you ain't got to do all that. And they don't accept tips out there, so they really just, you know what I'm saying? They just be working like that. Just be working like that. So it's like, damn, I can't even, you know what I'm saying? Bless you the way that you sit here blessing me, but you just like, hey, you just grateful to be serving. You know what I mean? So it's just like, oh uh, yeah, China was China was dope, man. Even the relationships I was able to establish with the actual Chinese people. Oh man, even though I could barely speak, <laughs> communicate with these folks, it was you know saying it's a number of love there. You know what I'm saying? It's just genuineness and um, I heard that the work I think there oh, crazy any country in this planet. Crazy, crazy. Like how I don't know you where you where you at, but um average work hours here in America is eight hours. That's a typical work day. Over there is twelve. Twelve, wow. Yeah, it's twelve for them. You know what I mean? And the kids they are pretty much on the same type of time, too. When they're not in school, best believe they're doing something extracurricular for the rest of the day. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Either you, you play an instrument, you play a sport, you, you're doing extra studies, you learn learning another language, you're doing something extracurricular for, for the rest of the day. You know what I'm saying? They have their days are just as long as the adults over there. So, yeah, they, yeah, they, they, they are very hardworking people, very, very hardworking people. And sure. how long after did you write the book, 14 Day uh, in Beijing? After uh, so, when you left the country, how long or when did you start putting your thought together to be able to say, uh -huh. that? that's worth the book? Okay, so I was released on like April 17th, 2019. So I got back to America like 15 hours later. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I didn't start writing the book until like July. And that idea, because I knew I wanted to do something with the story i just had no clue what um i was with one of my tribal members and we was just powwowing and he was and he was a published author before we graduated high school in 2014 so he was the one that posed the idea like hey well, you should write a book about your experience i'm like that's a good idea <laughs> like that's a good that's a great idea for sure how do i go about doing that i have no clue so he threw me a little alley -oop and gave me a, a, a brief little outline to fill in it was like five layers, and I just started filling it in on because uh, he put it in the notes on my phone. So I started filling in, and then I was like, "Okay, this is getting pretty lengthy. Let me move uh, uh, this, this from my notes to a Google Doc. Move it to a Google Doc, and that's when I like started writing, writing it for real. It only took me four months to write this entire story. Um, so I started writing in July. I was done with it by like November, and then after that, that's when it was just editing just editing, formatting, and fine-tuning, creating the cover, and all of that. Um, you have a copy of the cover? What'd you say? you have a copy of the cover so I could see it? I do, actually. <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot here. Uh, you good. Oh, that is a very attractive cover. So pretty much all I did was recreate my mugshot. Cause I'm like, I wish I had, 
I was like, I wish I had the mug shot they took because they had they recorded it on their body camera. I wish I had that footage. I'm like, I wish I had everything just to make this story even better. I'm like, I don't, so I got to recreate it. So <laughs> I, I just recreate. I, I really yeah. like that. It's really amazing. It's a uh, yeah. very uh, captivating in a way. You look at it. Oh my God, this is like especially the lighting in the back. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> you look like you're in a dungeon. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when you enter in the unknown, it can feel like that, though. You in a place of the that, unknown. You had, beside the dream that you had, the premonition dream to say the 1.4 gram means 14 days. You just didn't know. You didn't have a clue when you were ever going to leave the country. Mm-mm. Not at all. Did that bring it's in just... fear beside your positivity, beside your laws of attraction that you think positive and you get positive? At this point, did you panic at all? No, I, I, I wasn't nervous at all. Uh-uh. Not at all, especially when everything popped off like the very first day, because I was still high vast majority of that day. So I'm like, <laughs> I'm just, you know what I'm saying? I'm just just going with the flow. Honestly, it wasn't until later, you know what I'm saying? They act, I actually res- arrived at the jail jail. I'm completely sober about by this point. And that's when it hit me like, okay, this is real. <laughs> like, this is real. Like, man, this is real. I'm still not nervous. I'm not scared of nothing. I'm not fearful. I know I'm going to be good. I just don't know what's going to happen. I don't know how this thing gonna play out. And that's just the most nerve wracking part, but I know I'm gonna be good when it's all said and done. I just gotta stay down. And as eventually, you know what I'm saying? I got tired of getting my hopes up. Cause I'm like, I just gotta, all right, let's make it to this day. You know what I'm saying? Okay. I know I gotta make it to the weekend at least before people realize that I'm missing. Once people realize I'm missing, the search for me will begin. So I gotta at least wait two, three days. All right, boom, that happened. All right, well, you know what I'm saying? I just got to set little goals, minor, minor goals to just continue to, you know what I'm saying, keep my spirits high. Okay, let's wait till Monday. Maybe we'll hear some Monday. All right, let's, maybe Wednesday. We met, you know what I'm saying? We might hear some Wednesday. And then one, it just got to a point. I was like, okay, I'm getting my hopes up. Ain't nothing happening. You know what I'm saying? Just, it is what it is, bro. Like, you know what I'm saying? Just, it is what it is, man. Just, just make yourself numb to it and just truly just give it to the universe and to the ancestors, man. Just fully just let go, bro. And let them handle it. And as soon as I did that, the very next day, they came and called me to come uh, to leave. <laughs> you know, having this kind of attitude, this kind of like perception about what's going to happen to you and not knowing what is going to happen, it's not a lot of people have that capacity. Not a mm-hmm. lot of people could have what you have. So if you could just give uh, a little words of wisdom to all yeah. our listeners, tell them exactly, you know, from this point forward, when you look at life and when life hits you with a ton of brick, how do you have, or what, what should you do to be able to cope with those changes and look at the positive? Okay. Hold up one second. Let me plug, uh, put my uh, charger on this laptop so we don't die. Great conversation. The last thing I need is this computer dying. Definitely don't need that. But all right, so can you repeat that question again for me? So uh, because of what you went through, the turmoil, the the challenges, not knowing when you're going to be uh, basically leaving the country and coming back to the U.S., um, how did you, well, what can you suggest to our listeners when it comes to dealing with or finding the positive in every negative situation and how to be able to cope with those challenges and mm. still look at the, 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 you know, look at the light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak. That, man, <laughs> man, it's just, it really just depends. It just boils down to the individual at the end of the day. It's like just how I am mentally, spiritually and emotionally, man, you don't really come across any individuals that possess these traits and these qualities and these characteristics. So it's a lot easier said, for me than it is done for the vast majority of others, but everything just boils down to perspective. At the end of the day, perspective is everything, how you choose to look at something. And it's, a, and it's really a choice at the end of the day. Yeah, I could have been sitting there pointing the finger, placing the blame, dwelling on the negative. I could have been doing all of that, but I chose not to. I'm like, what good would that bring? You gotta give what you want. You got to put out into the universe what you want to re- come back to you. So if I'm steady just putting out negative, you know what I'm saying, negative energy, negative affirmations, and you know what I'm saying, just point, just 
that, that I'm like, that's not going to help my case, my situation any better. It's not. So the, my best bet is to just remain positive. <laughs> you know what I mean? Everything's going to work out. You you in tune. You tapped in with your, with your spirituality. Everything is going to work out the way that it's supposed to at the end of the day. That is amazing. You gotta, you know what I'm saying? Just trust the process, man. Trust God. Trust the process for sure. And yeah, if you know what I'm saying? Adversity, and know that adversity introduces a man to himself or adversity introduces a woman to herself. So when you're going through that adversity, take it, you know what I'm saying? Take it to the chin. Take what you're supposed to take away from the situation and apply it to your life moving forward, but never let no hard time humble you. you well, that is profound. Very, very profound. Well, Chancellor, that's all the time we have for today's podcast. I really do appreciate the time that you took out of your very busy schedule to join us. Now, thank you all for participating and inspiring our many listeners. Now, we hope that you have all enjoyed today's episode, and I'm very excited about the many upcoming guests that we have scheduled for the Happiness Journey podcast filled with inspirational stories just like the one you listen today. Now, here are a few concluding words of wisdom, which actually applies to your story. How is it that with so many brilliant beings on our planet, so few recognize that when one's life encounters turbulence, choppy waters, or setbacks, it's always a sign that things are about to get wildly better than they've ever been before. And by brilliant beings, I'm surely talking about you, my friends. This time, just accept it. My name is Dr. Dan Amzalag, and you may all keep pursuing your amazing journey in life. Thank you all for listening.